Well, good morning, everybody. How's it going? Good. My name is Joseph. Happy to be here with you today. So I'll tell a little story here. Back in 2015, I was a pastor at a church in Colorado, and I had the chance to go and visit one of our church plants in Germany. They were planting a church in Cologne, Germany, so I got to go out there and visit with the pastor there, visit with his family. And uh, anyone ever been to Cologne, Germany, by chance? Oh, all right. More, more than I expected. It's not like premier tourist destination. It's not exactly the Caribbean. Very beautiful old city. But if you have been to Cologne, Germany, you ever go, you just look at a postcard, you Google it, you're going to notice something about that city right away. You are going to notice the Cologne Cathedral. And there's a reason you're going to notice it. It's ginormous. It's absolutely massive, old, gothic cathedral right there in the heart of the city. It dominates the landscape. Actually, we have a photo of the Cologne Cathedral right here. There you see it, just beautiful, old, gothic cathedral, absolutely stunning. Uh, It was completed in 1880, 515 feet tall. And when it was finished, actually, for a while there, for about a decade, it was the tallest building in the entire world. So I see this when I get to Cologne. Whoa, that's amazing. I admire it from a distance, snap a few photos. I honestly don't think too much of it, though. I'd spent a little bit of time in Europe previously when I was younger, And if you ever go to Europe, you're going to kind of notice something pretty quickly. Uh, Europe is lousy with churches and old cathedrals. Just old buildings everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's an old cathedral. So after a while, it starts to blend together. So huge building, very impressive. It wasn't until my last day there, the German family I was staying with, they said, look, you've got to take the tour. We have this great tour guide. We know you've got to take the tour. You have to learn the history behind this epic Gothic cathedral. Okay, sure. So I go and I join up with a few other tourists, and there's this local German woman who is taking us on this tour, and she does the typical tour guide thing. She talks about the art, she talks about the architecture, talks about the flying buttresses and the stained glass, everything you would expect from a tour from an old church. Now, I think she's going to lead us to the top for the grand finale, right? The, the grand conclusion, but she actually takes us to the top, and we get to look out of the city pretty early on in the tour. So I'm kind of wondering, well, how's she going to wrap this thing up? Like, that's, that's tough to beat, But she actually ends the tour by taking us back to where it all started. She goes back to the very beginning, to the foundation. And she goes to the cornerstone. And she shows us that first stone that was laid for this epic, massive cathedral. And we look at the year on that stone, and it's the year of our Lord, 1248. Do you guys remember when that building was finished? 1880. Now, for those of you who are not math people, that is 632 years. That's a long time. Over six centuries it took to build that one building. That is three times older than our nation. Like, that is nine or ten modern lifespans for the average American. How many lifespans was it for a medieval peasant? (laughs) They were known to live a little bit shorter lives than us. It's a long time. Now, here's the funny part. She said, you might think these people were crazy to design and build something that was going to take that long. What you have to understand is that the people who laid the foundation of this building, they weren't dumb. They were brilliant. They were wonderful, masterclass designers, the math, the art. In fact, every subsequent builder of every subsequent generation honored those original plans as much as they possibly could. They had this huge, grand vision that they laid down that cornerstone in pursuit of. But she said this, she said, those, fo- those folks were not foolish. They knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that they would never see that building finished. They knew their children would never see that building finished. And their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren, they knew it would take generations before anyone walked through the door of that church. She said, that seems kind of crazy to us. That's shocking to us. That shocking level of sacrifice and service and giving yourself to something that you're not even going to enjoy. And she let that sink in. And then she said something at the end of this tour, and it struck me at the time. It struck me so much I wrote it down all those years ago. And this is what this German tour guide said. I don't know how I feel about religion and churches, and spending money on things like big fancy buildings. I really don't even know if I believe in God. But I want to believe in something the way those people believed all those years ago. 
there's a part of me that wants to give my life to something completely, even if it's not about me. Now, every time I tell that story, I try to think of like, what word captures that kind of life? Like captures that kind of belief, that kind of faith that she's talking about. Because if I'm honest, I want that too. I want that for my life. I think purpose is a good word. You know, I want to live a purposeful life, pursuing something much bigger and grander than myself. I hope that's said about me one day. I think about a word like legacy. I hope I leave a good, enduring legacy. I hope the things that are said about me at my funeral are positive. I can think of some stories maybe I wouldn't want shared at my funeral as much. But I hope I leave an enduring and healthy legacy for the people after me. There's a lot of words we can throw at it, though, but I actually do think there's one word that captures that kind of faith, that captures that kind of life. And it might sound a little cheesy to you, but it's love. I think what she was describing was a life of love. Or specifically, to use a biblical term, it's agape love. Uh, Agape is one of the Greek words for love. There's a few different ones. Just like in our language, we like things, we love things. But agape was a special kind of love. It was divine love, heavenly love. It was sacrificial love. It was selfless love. And I think that that kind of love and a life focused on that kind of selfless, sacrificial love, man, I think that that does something to the human heart. I think that grabs our heart in some pretty incredible ways. I, we don't see it super often, but when we see it, we know it, right? It's that story, and there's so many of these stories like this. It's mind-boggling. But it's the story of the soldier who throws themselves on top of a grenade just without a second thought to save their comrades. It's this instinctual, selfless sacrifice to protect others. I think about single parents in this way all the time. And the grind, the sun up to sun down grind for single parents. And you know you're probably not going to get that many out of boys or out of girls. You might not even get a single thank you all week long. But you are giving yourself to providing and protecting and caring for others. Why? Why would you do that? Sometimes you ask yourself that laying in bed at night. But it's love. It's sacrificial, agape, heavenly love. Friends, that kind of love is powerful. That kind of life is powerful. And I think for us as a church, and I really think with all my heart for us as followers of Christ, that's the kind of life that we're pursuing. That's the kind of life we're chasing after, to live that kind of selfless, sacrificial life. That's what Jesus is building us towards and forming us into. Friends, I got some bad news though. It's not quick. It's not easy. (laughs) There's no three life hacks to speed up your spiritual formation process. There's no five shortcuts to Christ-likeness, to become like Christ. You need to live and love like Christ did. And the way we do that is by doing what the writer of Hebrews describes, by, by fixing our eyes on Jesus. The author And the perfecter of our faith, the one who started it and the one who's going to bring it to completion, the cornerstone and the finished product, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. That is what spiritual formation is all about. So we want to know where we're going. We got to go back to the start. And it starts with Jesus. And it starts with the life of love that we see exemplified in him. So for our time today, we are going to be talking about what does that final stage of spiritual formation and maturity look like? We've been in this series called Further, and it's really all about that journey that we take to move further up and further in to Christ-likeness, and it's a messy process. (laughs) We've been borrowing from a book called The Critical Journey. I think it's been really helpful. It's been helpful for me. It's been helpful for a lot of conversation I've had. And that book has given us some handles to talk about the biblical formation process of our souls, of our spiritual maturity. And so that book, The Critical Journey, has given us six stages that describe the journey of a Christ follower. 
I'm going to just recap those for you really briefly. If you've been with us these last few weeks, you've heard us talk about each of these. And if one of these grabs your heart or grabs your soul, grabs your attention, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the week dedicated to that subject. But the first one is recognition of God. It all starts with our desperate need for a Savior. And all of us, every single one of us in this room, our spiritual journey started with having a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. We just got to celebrate a lot of folks who have made that decision. And they are now moving into that second stage, which is the life of discipleship. That's apprenticeship, that's community, that's spiritual practice, spiritual, that's just learning. What does the way of Jesus even mean for me and my daily life, for my community? And to start surrounding myself with people who will help me with that. And then we move into stage three, the productive life. And this is the life where, honestly, I think a lot of church attendees reside. People who are committed to a church. We give, we serve, we're in community, we study our Bibles, we pray, we do the things of Jesus. And it's a fruitful, wonderful season of life. But then something happens. Those things that we used to do maybe lose their flavor. Or maybe tragedy strikes. And all of a sudden, we start to look inward. We don't necessarily like what we see. And we start that journey inward in our faith. And I always describe this almost like a, like a river boat would dredge a river. Do you guys know what a dredge is? These boats would go through a river and junk would just build up on the bottom of the river. So, so they have to loosen it up. So these, these boats drag these chains behind it and stuff gets knocked loose and it flows to the surface. And that's what the journey inward is all about. It's, it's junk and sin and idols and things that we thought were buried in the past long, long ago. And they start floating to the surface and it kind of stinks. And it's hard to look at, but it needs to get cleaned. It needs to get wiped away. It has to get dealt with. And that can often lead to a place called the wall. We don't like dealing with the past. We don't like dealing with heavy stuff like that. And so we either, we either turn back to an earlier stage of faith or we sometimes walk away. It's too hard. It's too hard to deal with that pain. Because there's no way through the wall except one brick at a time with Jesus. But beyond that, it's worth it. Because you know what you see on the other side of the wall? It's freedom. See, the journey outward is all about freedom. It is freedom. It is peace with Jesus. Tyler, our discipleship pastor, spoke on that last week, did a wonderful job, provided us with three beautiful biblical examples of people living out of freedom and peace. And this week, we're going to wrap up. We're going to look at the last one, which is that life of love. It's agape, selfless sacrifice. Now, Tyler gave you three examples last week for the journey outward. I'm going to give you one this week the life of love, and you'll never guess what it's going to be. It's Jesus. That, that, that narrows it down a little bit, but it also doesn't narrow it down, because I was changing passages left and right this week, like, where do I go to talk about the life of love? How can I, in a short amount of time, so you guys are going to be here about three hours today. Is that cool? Everyone got, to cancel your lunch plans? No. We'll keep it short. Here's actually my invitation for you, though. We're going to start in John chapter 13. It's a pretty familiar passage. It's Jesus in the upper room with his disciples the night before he was betrayed, abandoned, and crucified. And he's about to wash his disciples' feet. We're going to read that passage in a second. But here's, here's actually the broader invitation. There's something so special about John chapter 13 through 17. It's, it's four whole chapters of the Gospel of John, which is a story, uh, is, is a biography of Jesus in the New Testament, the Gospel of John. There's four chapters that John dedicates to this one meal. This one gathering with disciples, but it's so rich and so significant. And there's so many examples of the life on love on full display. So my encouragement for you this week, if you don't take anything else from this message, spend 10 minutes this week, every single day, just reading John 13 through 17. John 13 through 17. And I guarantee you, I mean this with all my heart. I believe this. You will walk away from that time with a clear understanding of who God is, what God is doing in your life, and who God is calling you to be. So that's my invitation for you. But I'm going to get you guys started this week. John chapter 13. We're going to start right at the beginning in verse 1. This is God's word. It was just before the Passover festival. And Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This is John just introducing the scene. He's letting us know Jesus knows what's in store and he is so focused and committed and dedicated to finishing well. So the evening meal was in progress, verse two. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, 
the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. This is language of surrender. It's language of wholehearted trust that Jesus is moving out from. That's important for what Jesus does next. So, knowing this, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you will have no part of me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not every one of them was clean. So right away, we see this is a beautiful example of the life of love on display. Setting aside pretense, setting aside position, Jesus begins to serve. He begins to care for others. Now, at a glance, and especially if you've been around in this series, I wanna, I wanna make this distinction. At a glance, stage six, the life of love, can look a lot like stage three, can look a lot like the productive life. They have a lot of similarities. They're both very others-focused. They're both keen to serve and take advantage of the opportunities in front of them to bring honor and glory to God and to build the body. The difference, though, from someone who is in stage three, the productive life, maybe an earlier stage of spiritual formation, is that person gives out of their abundance. Someone in stage six gives, out of, gives to the needs present, even to their detriment. So the person in stage three is all about using their gifts for the good of others. But someone in stage six is all about doing what needs to be done, no matter the cost to themselves. That actually can create a lot of tension socially when you see someone who is serving and loving and giving from a place of stage six. It makes people a little uncomfortable. Have you ever been around somebody that, someone who's genuinely spiritually mature, not, not someone who's pretending to be and kind of you know, putting you on blast and you know, trying to remind you of how great they are, but someone who's genuinely spiritually mature, it's almost... Uh, unnerving the things they say and how they react to situations. I was having lunch just this pa- a couple weeks ago with a couple from this church. And so randomly we were talking about money and they were talking about, you know, what would we do if we won the lottery? And, you know, what would you do if you won the lottery? And I'm thinking, oh man, I can think of all these things for my family, things we would do, the trips we would go on. And they're like, before I even had a chance to react, this couple started like, man, if we won the lottery on Friday, we'd be broke on Monday. I'm like, mm, yep, I hear you. But they're like, yeah, we're already doing, like we love serving people and helping people in need. Like, we're like, we could build so many homes for people if we won the lottery. Like, we could give away all this money. We could pay off so much medical debt for people, get people's student loans off their back. We could do so much good. We'd be broke by Monday. Isn't that right, Pastor? Isn't that what you would do? <laughs> Beat me to it. <laughs> yeah. Just, that's what I was thinking about. Not a jet ski pulling a hot tub. I don't even know if that exists, but okay, whatever. It's unnerving, and it just flowed out of them like that, and I thought, that's the life of love. That's someone who's so sold out on the way of Jesus. Like, there's not even a second thought. Of course I'm going to do that. To be around someone who is exhibiting that kind of selfless, agape, sacrificial love, it can be a little jarring, and that's actually what we see in Peter's interaction with Jesus. See, when Jesus comes to wash Peter's feet, Peter's like, ah, no thanks, Jesus. I got this. Don't you worry about it. Take a load off. What's his response? No. No, you shall, you, you shall never wash my feet. And implied in that statement is Peter saying, Jesus, this is embarrassing. Like, I'm embarrassed for you. Don't you know who you are? You're You're our teacher. You're a rabbi. Rabbis don't do this. Servants do this. Like, 
Not even the good ones, like the C-tier servants do this. The ones who really can't be trusted with anything else. They're the ones who are wiping the dirt and the grime and the crud of the ancient Near Eastern streets, pre-sewage off of people's feet before a meal. You don't, teachers don't do this. Rabbis do this. Jesus, messiahs don't do this. You're the anointed one. Don't you know who you are? He does. And that's one of the most beautiful signs of someone who's in stage six. They know exactly who they are. And they are so free and confident in that that even people, well-meaning people who are concerned about their reputation or their well-being or how kind of crazy or they're doing sounds, it doesn't phase them. They are completely free to surprise the people around them. This is from The Critical Journey, describing stage six. At stage six, we choose to do anything God asks, whether it's the most menial or the most prestigious thing. We are full of surprises because we are so free, so full of God and so whole. We can say or do preposterous things because we are not afraid of death. That's physical death. That's death of our finances. It's death of our reputation. We are selfless. What matters most is who God is and who God makes us. That's such a beautiful thing because I, it's a good challenge for us in the church because I think so often in the church, we, we talk about service in such a limited way. It's not a bad way. It's actually, I think, incredibly important. It's a biblical way of talking about serving and caring for others. But we often talk about serving through the lens of spiritual gifts. Well, you got to figure out what your spiritual gifts are. You got to get mature. You got to go and you know, you know, find your passion. Now, you find, find what really just brings you to life and go and do that. That's what you create. And that's true. That is a wonderful thing to do. That's part of discovering who God has uniquely made us. Friends, let me, let me tell you a secret. Jesus didn't have the spiritual gift of washing feet. He just did what needed to be done. That's what the life of love is all about. It's doing what needs to be done. Even if it's not in your wheelhouse. Even if it doesn't bring you any glory. Even if it doesn't lift up the spotlight on who God has uniquely made you to be. He just did what needed to be done. And there's something special even about how he did this. Because it's not just that Jesus, Lord, Rabbi, the Son of God himself, is wearing a servant's cloth and washing crap off of people's feet. It's not just that. It's who he does it for. And this is alluded to at a few points in that passage I read too. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Whose feet does he also wash? Judas. Twice it gets mentioned in there, and then after this, it gets explained even more. Jesus is fully aware that Judas is about to betray him. And what does Jesus choose to do? He washes his feet. Whew. Whew. It's not just what he does. It's who he does it for. See, the life of love, it honestly, at the surface, looks a little crazy. That's kind of crazy behavior. Not just for someone as prestigious and powerful and glorious is Jesus to wash feet, but to do that for someone who is just moments away from stabbing him in the back, man, that's kind of crazy. See, Jesus is providing his disciples, and I think he's providing us with an example. And it's not just how to serve, it's who to serve. And that's what Jesus actually ends this little section by saying, verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, He put on his clothes, this is Jesus, and he returned to his place. And he says, do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Those are titles of position and power. That is what I am. So now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him, aka, you can't get off the hook with this one. You say you're gonna follow me. That means doing the things I did. 
for the people I did it for. So now that you know these things and you do them, you know them, you will be blessed by them. See, a life of love, as crazy, counterintuitive as it is, isn't just a blessing for other people. It actually is a blessing for us. It is a remarkable way to live your life, to orient your life. And as we wind down, I want to, I actually really wrestle with how, man, how do we meaningfully wrap up this series? How do we meaningfully wrap up this message? Tyler pointed out last week that these last couple stages, they're, they're really hard to teach on because they're so personal. I don't know exactly kind of who those people are in your life that are hard to serve, hard to love, hard to forgive. I don't, I don't know exactly the specific situations that you've endured in your past and what it would mean for you to forgive, to forgive, to let go of resentment. I don't know. But I, I can't set some examples for you. I, I can set some examples for you and I can remind you of something that's really true. The thing that's really true is this, is no matter where you are at in your spiritual journey, no matter where you're at in that circle of faith formation, you know where the love of God is? Everywhere. Every single stage. You are not more loved in stage six than you were in stage two. You are not more loved in stage four than you were in stage one. The love of God is almost like a clock face. Those hands turn and reach every single section of that. God loves you fiercely and truly no matter where you are, even if you feel stuck. Even if you're saying to yourself, there ain't no way I can live that kind of life. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. So that is what's true. I want to end our time with two, two real-world examples of what I think kind of exemplify the life of love. Uh, one's from, from far away in the modern church. It's a, it's a church in Africa, and, and one's actually closer to home. The one uh, from a church in Africa is actually from the nation of Burundi, which I didn't even know where it was. I had to look this up. Uh, I had a pastor share this story with me a couple of years ago. He shared it with me and, and several others, and the uh, story really struck me. And this pastor told me the story of a man in Burundi named Little Bird. And that was not his, his actual name. It wasn't his given name. Uh, uh, it was a nickname that his family had given him because he always had a song ready. He was just one of those super musical kids, just always whistling and humming and singing, always had a song ready. Maybe you know someone like that in your life. So his name was Bignoni, which means Little Bird in that language. And so Bignoni was an infectious young man, just, just loved people like crazy. He loved Jesus with his whole heart. He grew up in the faith, and he shared that faith with others, and he was just singing and serving and loving people really well. And he wanted to be a teacher, and he went off to teacher's college, even though he came from pretty meager means, from a pretty poor family. He was able to go off to a teacher's college and just excelled with the opportunities he had. He, did, he was top of his class at teacher's college. He was voted student body president. And he, he graduated. He moved back to the community he was from because he just wanted to teach children. He was always singing as he did this. And he did such a wonderful job as a teacher that pretty quickly he became the principal of the school that he was at. Until one day, a group of soldiers showed up at the school's front door. And they had a clipboard and had a list of 12 names on that clipboard. And his name was one of them. Um, and it was a list of Hutus. Now, this was a time, and sadly, it's still, it's still a time in that part of Africa, there's a lot of tribal conflict. And it was a conflict between two groups, the Tutsis and the Hutus. And the Tutsis had all the power. The armies, the weapons, the influence, and the Hutus were, were honestly mostly farmers. Um, if you've seen Hotel Rwanda, Rwanda is right next door to Burundi, so it tells a, a big part of this story. But these Tutsi soldiers showed up at the door with a clipboard and a list of names saying, we, we have these names and we've been sent to kill you. And so they gathered up these Hutu teachers, Bignoni, Little Bird, and his 11 teachers he was responsible for, and they took him to a hilltop outside the school. And as they're marching over there, one of the teachers, one of the younger men, just, just starts to break down. He breaks down sobbing. And he begs the lieutenant who's in charge of soldiers, he's like, you have to shoot me first. He's like, you have to shoot me first. He's like, I cannot bear the thought of you hurting my brothers. I can't, I can't see that. And Bignoni, little bird, he jumps in right away and he says, no, no, no. He tells that lieutenant, he's like, you will shoot me first. I am the leader. You will shoot me first and every single one of you will see what a glorious thing it is to go and be with Jesus. 
And then Bignoni turned to that lieutenant and he said, may I pray for you? And the soldiers really didn't know what to make of that. Never had anyone ask to, to pray for them in their line of work. And they said, yeah, yeah, you can, you can pray for us. So little birdie starts to pray and he starts to pray for those teachers who are with him. He starts to pray that they would have courage, that they would experience God's presence, that God is near to the brokenhearted. He prays for their families, that God would take care and provide for their families. But then he starts to pray for those soldiers. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. These men are about to do a terrible and evil thing, and it will weigh them down for the rest of their lives. It'll be a weight that they can't get out from under. So God, please send someone to them to share with them the love of Jesus, the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus so that they can actually be free from that weight someday. And at this point, the soldiers are a little shaken up. They're, they're not sure what to do and they have a little conference and they're trying to decide. As you would probably expect in this area, these, these aren't hardened killers. They're mostly young men themselves who've been forced into service. And so the lieutenant explains to them, he's like, look, their names are on the clipboard. And if we go back to the barracks and we haven't killed them, then we will, we will be killed. Like, we have to do this. And so they line the men up and they're getting ready to shoot them. And then Ben Yoni, little bird, he said, I have one last question. He said, can I sing you a song? He always had a song ready. And the soldiers were, again, pretty confused by this, kind of taken aback. But that lieutenant thought about it and he said, yes, you may sing. And Little Bird started to sing an old song. That's an old, old hymn. Maybe, maybe some of you sang it in your church growing up. Maybe you've heard of it. And the first verse goes like this. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Into your gladness, freedom, and light, Jesus, I come to you. And he sang that first verse. And he got to the second and the third verse. And those, those 11 other men who were with him, they took courage and they started to sing too. And then you had 12 men. You had 12 condemned men who start singing this old hymn together on this hilltop. They're singing with everything they got, all their hearts, their souls, their minds, their strength, their love for each other and their love for God. And they're just singing and they're singing and they get to this last verse. Out of the fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. Into the joy and light of your home, Jesus, I come to you. And the song ended, and the soldiers raised their rifles and shot and killed those 12 men on that hilltop outside of that school. The life of love is crazy. It's upside down. It's this life that says, love your enemies, pray for them. It's this crazy Life where you sacrifice and you lay a foundation for a building you're never even going to see and enjoy. You give everything you have to protect people you care about. You wash the feet of people who are about to trade. The life of love is, is crazy. It's beautiful too. It's more than that. It's powerful. See, that was the last song of Little Bird. You're probably wondering, how in the world do we know this story if all those men died? Well, it wasn't his last song after all. It's the craziest thing. Those soldiers got back to their barracks right after killing those men. And they went right to the nearest pub. And they got as drunk as they could, as fast as they could, trying to forget what they had done, all except one of them, except that lieutenant. And he was so haunted by what had happened, he didn't touch a drop. And he walked through the streets of the nearby city and he came across his old Christian literature center. And he found this old Quaker woman who had been born in Africa and he went and he said, I, do you have a Bible? Do you have a Bible I could, I could buy? And she was curious what, what's going on. And she said, yeah, wh why is that? And he said, I need to know about the God who would give men the courage to die the way I saw men die today. I need that God. I need that kind of courage. I need that kind of life. 
And so that man prayed to accept Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he went back to the barracks and he shared the gospel with several of those other soldiers and several of them gave their life to Christ. As the pastor who told me the story, he said, I wish, I wish I could tell you the end of the story because they killed that lieutenant trying to shut him up. But the story kept spreading. It always does. It's like we as human beings, we can't stop talking about sacrificial, selfless love like that. Something that's bigger than ourselves. I think that's why we are here today talking about Jesus. I think that's why we'll be here next week. I think that's why the church will always be meeting because there's no greater story to tell. There's no greater story to be part of than the life of love. And so my friends, that's my invitation to you. Keep going. Further up, further in, one day at a time, remembering that Jesus will bring to completion that work that he began in you. He will do it.